13 February 1967. Apropos of the exhibition of savagery paintings by Huta, 10 February 1967. Here is a letter from Shamsunda Junjunwala to the mother. The savagery exhibition is full of images of savagery, the ascension of the being, the descent of the divinity, and the play of the divine that radiates light, equally beautiful and powerful. That gives the sense that I am close to you. Is this my imagination, or is it true? It is absolutely true, and I am happy you have seen it. Blessings, Mother. 21st February 1967, message for Mother's 89th birthday. <clears throat> when darkness deepens, strangling the earth's breast, and man's corporeal mind is the only lamp, as a thief's in the night shall be the covert tread of one who steps unseen into his house. A voice ill heard shall speak, the soul obey, a power into mind's inner chamber steal, a charm and sweetness open life's closed doors, and beauty conquer the resisting world. The truth light capture nature by surprise, a stealth of God compel the heart to bliss, and earth grow unexpectedly divine. Sri Aurobindo Savitri, 3rd April 1967. And there is a very amusing observation. It's exactly what Sri Aurobindo wrote in Savitri. The wise men talk and sleep. God grows up while the wise men talk and sleep. A few shall see what none yet understands. God shall grow up while the wise men talk and sleep. For man shall not know the coming till its hour, and belief shall be not till the work is done. And that's how it is, wholly unconscious of what goes on. I don't say it, I'm saying it to you, but they are wholly unconscious. I constantly feel I am using a candle snuffer so as not to be really unbearable. 3rd May, 1967. Four means manifestation. Five means power. Six means new creation. Seven means realization. With this four, five, six, seven, there are quite amusing things. Mother refers to the date, four, five, six, seven. Some people have the attitude of writer of wrongs. There are people like that. And take their own example of a wrong they have suffered, which must be righted. And they say, this will be the mother's symbol. Another would like cameras to be sensitive enough to photograph the presence invisible to the human eye. That also comes. They are things that come in the atmosphere of the mother. Another, several others it seems, thinks that on the day the Indian New Year will begin, others, everyone thus imagines something and it comes into the atmosphere. It's amusing. And I always think of that passage in which he says, God shall grow up. Grow up in matter, of course. 
and you see the divinity grow up in matter, and matter being made more and more capable of manifesting the divine. And he says, while the wise men talk and sleep, it's exactly that, and it's charming. If you shall see what none yet understands, God shall grow up while the wise men talk and sleep. For man shall not know the coming till its hour, and belief shall be not till the work is done. 24th May, 1967. Yesterday someone wrote to me asking, after all, what is the divine? I answered. I told him that I was giving a reply to him, but there could be a hundred which would all be good, one as good as another. The divine is lived, but cannot be defined. And then I added, but as you put to me the question, I answer, the divine is the absolute of perfection, eternal source of all that exists, of whom we become conscious progressively, all the while being himself from all eternity. 7th June, 1967. I remember a very powerful line in Savitri which says it all wonderfully in a few words. He says, the bodiless namelessness that saw God born. The bodiless namelessness that saw God born and tries to gain from mortal's mind and soul a deathless body and a divine name. 25th October, 1967, the mother reads Savitri. A divine force shall flow through tissue and cell and take the charge of breath and speech and act and all the thoughts shall be a glow of suns and every feeling a celestial thrill, often a lustrous inner dawn shall come, lighting the chambers of the slumbering mind. A sudden bliss shall run through every limb, and nature with a mightier presence fill. Thus shall the earth open to divinity, and common natures feel the wide uplift, illumine common acts with the Spirit's ray, and meet the deity in common things. Nature shall live to manifest secret God. The Spirit shall take up the human play. This earthly life become the life divine. 6th January, 1968. I wanted to show you something, then I forgot. Maybe you've seen it. It's something I am supposed to have said to M years ago, many years ago, about Savitri. He noted it down in French, and quite recently, that is perhaps three or four weeks ago, he showed me what he had noted. And as it happens, he showed it not only to me, but to others. They've translated it into English, and now they want me to read it aloud so they can play it at the playground. I wanted to revise the French with you, but they want it in English. The English isn't too good, but that doesn't matter. They are all enthusiastic and happy. 
as for me, I don't like it because the form of it is so personal. Have you seen the French text? Yes, I have. So, he certainly caught something of your vibration. That can be felt. But I don't know how it would come out once you repeat it. If you could say something anew on Savitri, ah, uh, but you know, I am no longer the same person. I no longer say the same things. It's impossible. Impossible. I have been looking at it. In fact, this whole story has come back now as if to illustrate the huge difference, huge but colossal difference in the state of consciousness. For me now, that notation about savagery is such a personal vision of things. Yesterday, I had an interesting day from that point of view. It's the physical ego that has been destroyed and is now like this, gesture with arms open upward. So it finds it odd. I don't know how to explain. This way of putting oneself in the center of things and seeing them in relation to that center of consciousness seems so... You understand, the consciousness is spread out. It's as much there or there as here. And it sees everything in relation to a higher central consciousness. The mother brings her two arms together, joining the tips of her hands above her head in a triangle pointing towards the Supreme, which is like a kind of beacon, all an immutable, all-powerful beacon, throwing the same light on all things without the least personal reaction of any sort. And the last vestiges, yesterday they seemed to be the last ones because of this text they had asked me to read. Naturally, when I speak, I say I because it's the body that speaks, but it has no sense of I. It, it's very hard to explain. Anyway, because of this affair, I said, Ah, but how, how can that be said when it's not me? There's no me. It's not me. And at the same time, there was this consciousness above saying, no personal reactions. There's no more me. And if this must be done, let it be done. And for hours and hours, there was such a peculiar state in which everything, it, it was like kinds of vestiges or pieces of bark, I don't know, pieces of something a bit hard or shriveled which had crumbled and were turning into dust and nothing, nothing but this great vibration gesture like two great wings beating in the infinite. So powerful, so calm, the whole day. A sort of perception that life in a seemingly personal form like this one is only for action, only for action, for the requirements of action, and there must be no reactions. Only the instrument acting, acting on the supreme impulse without reactions. And the perception was so clear that all, but all memories have been abolished and are being increasingly abolished. So there may only remain a sort of mass of vibrations organized so as to make you do what needs to be done in the whole for everything to be prepared and gesture of ascent for everything to grow to strive more and more towards the transformation. 
that makes speaking difficult because of this old habit. Maybe also a necessity to make oneself understood of using the word I, I. What's this I? It no longer corresponds to anything except for a mere appearance. And this appearance is the only contradiction. That's the interesting point. This appearance is clearly a contradiction of the truth. It's something that still belongs to the old laws, at least, in fact, in its appearance. And because of that, you are forced to say things in a certain way. But it doesn't correspond. It doesn't correspond to your state of consciousness, not in the least. There is a fluidity, a breadth, a sort of totality, and above all, more and more strongly, the sense that this, pointing to the body, must grow increasingly supple, supple, fluid, so to speak, so as to express without resistance or distortion the vision, the real vision, the real state of consciousness. To the consciousness, this possibility of fluidity, of plasticity, is growing more and more evident, with only, only just something outwardly which is increasingly becoming an illusion. And yet, yet that's what others see, understand, know, and call me. And it truly strives and strives to adapt more and more. But time still appears to have its importance. It's a curious state of transition. 17th January, 1968. Regarding an old conversation of the mothers on savagery, noted down from memory by a young disciple. They're so happy, so enthusiastic. Everyone comes and says, oh, how fine it is. I thought, how much must one err for people to find it fine? When one no longer errs, they no longer like it. There you are. And they want to publish it. Sri Aurobindo used to write at night. And in the night, I would have the experience. In the morning, he would read it to me, and I would recognize my experience. I hadn't said anything to him. He hadn't said anything to me. Interesting. But one always seems to be boasting. That's the trouble. No, in reality, one can say a thing like this, but writing and publishing it is quite another matter. 4th May, 1968. I was all alone, concentrated, and two sentences and two sentences came in answer to her letter, which I wanted to write down. I started writing, and I found myself writing with a tiny handwriting. I tried to make it bigger, impossible. Then I drew within, I looked, And I saw it was Sri Aurobindo who was writing. So naturally, I let him write. It's not his handwriting, but not mine either. It's a sort of combination of both. I had the same experience years ago 
very soon after that, quote, illness, when I began translating Savitri here. One day, while writing, it was he who wrote. It was his handwriting. That is nearly illegible. So, laughing, I said, no, I don't want it, because it was illegible. <laughs> if it had been clearer than mine, I, I'd have been happy, and I stopped. But it came the day before yesterday, and it was, I forget where I put that paper. Here is the text, found later. Divine life in the process of evolution, the divine consciousness at work in matter, here is, so to speak, what this existence represents. Divine life in the process of evolution, the divine consciousness at work in matter, here is, so to speak, what this existence represents. And at the same time, there was the clear vision, the very clear consciousness of the whole thing from the point of view of the Earth's evolution what's being worked out in the Earth's evolution. 27th May, 1968. Sri Aurobindo has written in Savitri, Yes, there are happy ways near to God's Son, but few are they who tread the sunlit path. Only the pure in soul can walk in light. What a joy it would be to possess the required purity. When one is living among men with all their miseries, it is only the grace that can bestow this state. Even in those who by the pasya have abolished their ego, it is beyond all personal effort. 17th June, 1968. Sri Aurobindo speaks of Savitri's firmness of purpose in the following line. Immutable, like a fixed eternal star, this is the great mystery of creation. Immutable and yet eternally renewed. 24th June, 1968. Savitri says, Not only is there hope for Godhead's pure, the violent and darkened deities leaped down from the one breast in rage to find what the white gods had missed. They too are safe. A mother's eyes are on them and her arms stretched out in love desire her rebel sons. What had the white gods missed? The conversion of the Asuras. 26th June, 1968. Isn't the power of the Asuras as boundless as the power of the gods? The vibrations of evil are in truth less powerful than the vibrations of good. 28th June, 1968. Can one say that total sincerity and the abolition of the ego are closely interdependent? Only the Supreme Lord is perfectly sincere. And when the ego is abolished, only the Supreme Lord exists. 
3rd July, 1968. But I have work to do. I no longer have time. I no longer have time to do anything. That is to say now, F has taken it into her head to translate Savitri with me. Parentheses. All she does is look in the dictionary when I need a word. End parentheses. Right from the start. And I've reached the second page. It'll take 10 or 15 years. But I find it very interesting because I have only to be still and Sri Aurobindo dictates to me. So there remains one or two little corrections in the French, and that's that. He tells me the word. For this word, this word. Like that. It's very interesting. Only I do five or six lines every time. But now I do it better than I used to. 28th October 1968. In my perception, the push the mother gives me towards the transformation of my banality and my mediocrity, I re recollect the phrase from Savitri. All can be done if the God touch is there. Once one has the contact, with the divine consciousness. Then mediocrity of the outer being becomes evident. But the promise of Savitri is true and will be realized. 1st November 1968. Each time I come to you, I must make it an occasion for making progress towards the goal. Ashwapati is pretty fortunate because for him, each day was a spiritual romance. Each happening was a deep experience. The possibility is open to all in whom the aspiration is fervent. Persevere and you will have the experience. 7th November, 1968, from Savitri. A knowledge which became what it perceived, replaced the separated sense and heart, and drew all nature into its embrace. Is Sri Aurobindo referring here to knowledge by identity? Yes, it is a very exact description. 9th November 1968. A greater force than the earthly held his limbs, unwound the triple cord of mind, and freed the heavenly wideness of a Godhead's gaze. What does the triple cord of mind mean? The cords symbolize the limitations of the mind, and there are three of them, because there is a physical mind, a vital mind, and a mental mind. 11th November, 1968. The days were travelers on a destined road. The nights, companions of his musing spirit. Yes, there comes a time when nothing, absolutely nothing, is outside the yoga. And the Divine's presence is felt and found in all things and all circumstances. 15th November, 1968. A last high world was seen where all worlds meet, in its summit gleam, where night is not, nor sleep, the light began of the Trinity Supreme. 
Is the Trinity Supreme Satchitananda? Yes. 19th November, 1968. Our body's cells must hold the immortal flame. Is this the secret of the luminous body? It is a poetic way of expressing the transformation which is going to take place and which is more complicated than that. 25th November, 1968. It seems to me that the flame that calls and the flame that responds are one and the same. Essentially, they are the same, but the plenitude of the response far exceeds the intensity of the call. The response always exceeds our receptivity by far. 29th November, 1968. None can reach heaven who has not passed through hell. But still, doesn't the soul chosen by the divine go through hell in a different way than others? The quotation means that in order to reach the divine regions, one must, while on earth, pass through the vital, which in some of its parts is a veritable hell. But those who have surrendered to the divine and been adopted by him are surrounded by the divine protection and for them the passage is not difficult. 3rd December 1968 His failure is not failure whom God leads because it is part of the play? It is the human mind that has the conception of success and failure. It is the human mind that wants one thing and does not want another. In the divine plan, each thing has its place and its importance. So it is not success that matters. What matters is to be docile and, if possible, a conscious instrument of the divine will. To be and to do what the divine wants, this is the truly important thing. 21st December 1968 all things shall change in God's transfiguring hour. Can man delay or hasten the coming of this hour? Neither the one nor the other in their apparent contradiction created by the separative consciousness, but something else that our words cannot express. In the present state of human consciousness, it is good for it to think that aspiration and human effort can hasten the advent of the divine transformation. Because effort and aspiration are needed for the transformation to take place. <clears throat> 